Welcome back to Revolution and Ideology. I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And today we are continuing our deep dive into colonial case studies. And today we are going to be looking at Japan's colonization of Korea. Without further ado, I just want to dig into this because we have a lot to cover. I'm going to lay out some super brief surface level context first. Again, I'm going to skip over a whole lot of Japanese and Korean history of the 18th, 19th century here just to lay out a groundwork. I also want to start with the preface that I am not a native Korean, Japanese, or when we talk about China a little bit, Mandarin speaker, so I may mispronounce some things. And for that, again, I'm, I'm laying out an apology to begin. Um, but let's, let's, let's get going here. So I want to start with the context of Japan, super briefly. Again, I want to talk about the Meiji Restoration. Uh, it basically replaced the Tokugawa Shogunate. It starts in 1868. Without going through the Tokugawa Shogunate, I must stress uh, it's important because towards the end of it, um, internal and external pressures led to its collapse. And eventually the 15th Tokugawa resigns. And that brings back um, the restoration of the Emperor Meiji. I want to talk real briefly about what was attempted in the restoration um, during the Emperor Meiji's uh, measures that were being brought back. Ideally, there was an attempt to manufacture and socialize a new identity under the Meiji Restoration, both social and individual, and the manufacture of a nation. I bring this up because during the towards the end of the Tokugawa Shogunate, there were some various Western incursions. Um, there was even a port called Dejima in which the Portuguese and later on the, uh, the Dutch began to trade. Uh, the U.S. showed up with Commodore Perry in 1853 and a little bit of gunboat, gunboat diplomacy. I bring these examples up because some in Japan, not all, but some in Japan had thought when they began to learn about some of these Western cultures that they had fallen a little bit behind in terms of ideal and material properties. So ideology um, and importantly, technology. These things um, had, had lagged a little bit if they were doing some sort of comparison. One of those ideologies would be this, this new understanding of what it meant to be a collective nation. And it really informed what the Emperor Meiji was going to try and accomplish. Both modernized Japan with a new national identity by calling back to more traditional, purely cultural Japanese um, understandings of who they were and where they come from. So it's this interesting synthesis that's going to take place. Um, materially, uh, the emperor also began to reorganize feudal lands into prefectures. There would be urban prefectures, rural prefectures, and state prefectures. Uh, essentially, old feudal leaders, lords, samurai, they'd be paid off with modern stipends or bonds. And that leads me to the next point that I'm going to make regarding Japan at this point. They began to nationalize a taxation system, which again was 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 a modernizing element. They also conscripted a new national army in 1872. Um, even uh, this new national army ends up defeating the last samurai holdouts in 1877 using modern Western tactics and arms and so on and so forth. Cue uh, Tom Cruise movies about last samurai and whatnot. But regardless, I want to keep moving here. Nationalist ideology was tied to modernization, as I've already mentioned, but with an appeal to traditional bloodlines tied back to, of course, the sun goddess Amaterasu. The emperor uh, himself would end up being semi-divine, but political power actually relied in various advisory boards. There was also a resurrection of certain Shintoist beliefs because, again, when you're trying to build this identity and pride in who, it, who, who Japan was at this time, Shintoism was, quote-unquote, indigenous in contrast to Zen Buddhism, which most um, had realized at that point had been imported through a long, long, long chain of events. Um, the other thing that takes place during the Meiji Restoration that's going to inform Japan's rationale for colonial processes is economic liberalism. They wanted to free themselves from the traditional feudal system that they had, but now they did become slaves to the market, both as a country and as individual people. I mention this as slave to the market because the market at this point in time, especially if we're talking about economic liberalism and what we would call 19th century capitalism, means that there is going to be this idea of growth for growth's sake, not necessarily growth for sustainability's sake, as had long been a tradition. This means that if you are going to grow beyond, of course, what your environment can provide you in terms of natural resources and so on and so forth, you're going to seek those resources elsewhere, which is going to inform part of the colonial process. 
Um, an 1889 constitution ends up being adopted. And again, it follows a lot of the Western lines of thinking regarding parliamentary structures and so on and so forth. But again, a lot of it is tied to this idea of economic growth. And that's one of the things that I think is important. I do want to uh, allow Nick to step in since I've been talking a little bit I, and, and just ask him this very brief question. What do you think about the adoption of a Western informed socioeconomic and political apparatus informs colonialism going forward? What do you think, what aspects jump out to you? Well, the one thing you said that I was thinking about is, you know, economic expansion requires resources, obviously, right? That's like economics 101. Right. And in the case of Japan, if you're a relatively small, like compared to like, you know, huge land masses like island, you don't have a lot of resources that are readily available if you want to compete on a global scale. I mean, even if you want to economically modernize and expand, even maybe on a relatively small scale, right? So you're going to have to seek that elsewhere. I mean, even large countries like the United States are obviously colonial, right? Et cetera. So Japan is clearly going to have to go somewhere else to support their economic modernization and expansion. And their consumptive habits, um, for lack yep. of a better term. Okay, so in contrast to that, now let's lay out a, a little bit of context for Korea around the same time. We're going to enter into Korea during the middle of one of their more um, famed uh, dynasties. And again, excuse my pr pronunciation, the Joseon dynasty, which had been established way back in 1392. Again, being as brief as possible, they also felt pressures from global actors throughout what, what Westerners are calling the age of exploration. This age of exploration and these, these quote unquote, um, um, pressures that they felt from out, outsiders um, challenged a lot of the neo-Confucian ideology that had operated in, in Korea for a very long time. They had operated with, again, similar type of feudal and imperial systems. However, again, we see some internal corruption that stems from a whole host of, within the dynasty, a whole host of children or child leaders that had risen to prominence because of hereditary right. They end up being preyed upon by their regents and internal advisory boards. Um, and quarrels led to a lot of political instability in the era that we're talking about. Also, European missionary work in Korea kind of tore at the ideal fabric of neo-Confucian we over me ethics. I don't want people to confuse when I say we over me as this was some sort of like middle-aged communism. It absolutely wasn't. It was predicated on, on, on honestly a caste system and filial piety, but essentially everyone sort of knowing their role within that system, understanding to an extent that their role was crucial um, to keeping essentially the Joseon dynasty together, um, which is important. We can critique the caste system a little bit later. I mean, I... There's, there's essentially like four levels. The Yangban were the lords. Uh, below them were the skilled laborers called the Jungin. And again, excuse my pronunciation. The Sangmin were the free commoners and the Qianmin was the low caste. And that included essentially saves. And, and, and within those four categories I just named, there are also subcategories. But essentially that system had worked in a way to keep the dynasty running for the better part of, of, of centuries at this point before Western, again, forays into Korea are going to start to tear that apart. Now, I must also say in terms of foreign relations, Korea had a very rich history, as most of you, most of our listeners will know, um, of relations between China and Japan being literally in between them that span millennia. And I don't have time to go back into all of those and who influenced who and, and what ideologies went where. I don't have time to get into that. Just know that there had been, again, millennia of interplay between Korea, China, and Japan. Um, some Western incursions of notes that, that, that kind of break that apart a little bit. We, I just briefly talked about Commodore, Commodore Perry showing up in Japan. Well, he showed up in Korea as well. Um, also, Korea was watching very closely what was going on um, to its neighbor China during the Opium Wars with what the British were doing in terms of controlling of the market and getting various parts of the Chinese market hooked on opium and profiting and so on and so forth and how that informed, uh, informed other British colonial projects like in India. Um, also, it must be noted that France itself attempted to invade Korea in 1866 to, quote unquote, protect recently converted Catholic converts. The U.S. Uh, makes another attempt in Korea when General Sherman attempts gunboat di diplomacy. His boat ends up being sunk. The United States responds by invading um, Gangwa Island in response, killing 243 Koreans, um, but does eventually leave. Um, and again, this is all of the 19th century, and I must say it's kind of tearing at the fabric of what had kept Korea together for, for, for hundreds of years. 
Um, we also can't talk about Korea with, uh, without mentioning at least czarist Russia to an extent. They were seeking colonial gains in the region on the peninsula. Um, and there's initially were somewhat, I, I even have them called here, low-key interludes into Korea, which is kind of interesting. As far as how the two nations in question here have some interplay, specifically Meiji, Japan's new rationale um, for I in Korea, um, there's a pretty good source we have on this. It comes to us from a person named Yi Wei, um, and they wrote Japanese colonial ideology in Korea. They're out of the University of Toronto. But I think I think this quote kind of sums up why Meiji Japan started to eye Korea uh, quite a bit towards the end of the 19th century. And I quote, on the one hand, Japanese ethnographers argued that Japanese and Koreans possessed considerable physiognomic, linguistic, and control and cultural similarities. On the other hand, Japanese ethnographers quickly insinuated differences between the two peoples. They branded Koreans as ignorant, lazy, and incapable of initiating progress. This simultaneous similarity in race and differences in dispositions and stages of development validated Japan's role in leading Korea in civilizational and cultural development. In this case, Japanese ethnographic knowledge produced justified Japan's eventual annexation of the Korean Peninsula in 1910. Japanese colonial ideology channeled itself through ethnographic knowledge production. I mention this because this quote, um, by way, basically insinuates that it was an idealistic rationale. But as we just got done talking about when I went through an overly brief description of Meiji Japan, I spoke mostly on the material conditions, the economic growth, as did Nick. Where does the ideal in this case um, fit in this conversation, Nick? I mean, very oftentimes we see the ideology, you know, generated afterwards to justify the material, the actions that are going to take place, right? Or that might already be taking place. So in this case, you know, the ideology exists to justify the co it's a colonial ideology, right? I mean, that's exactly what it is. So they fabricate the fact that, by the way, I'm not saying that they're like masterminds and doing this completely intentionally, or even like have knowledge of, right. you know, the entire, entire like social milieu that's going on, but an ideology is fabricated, right? A difference, whether it's, you know, dehumanization or like, you know, here it's ethnographic differences, right? Et cetera, right? To justify what's happening, what's going to happen <laughs> materially, you know? So the commonalities we see here already with, with again, the, the, the thing I'm trying to emphasize here is Japan, to be blunt during the Meiji Restoration, adopts a lot of Western mindsets. Let's just be blunt. I, I, I said it in a lot of fancy language before. I'm going to simplify it now. What I'm trying to say is they adopted a lot of Western rationales. And one of those things we can see that they adopted here besides nationalism was this idea of exceptionalism and this need to go out and justify the actions they're going to do through what we would call civilizing missions. Essentially, that's what we're saying. This is going to be a civilizing mission. What do you think? Yes? <laughs> I mean, that's what they all say, right? <laughs> and that's what they all say. So again, <laughs> we're seeing some commonalities here with this case study in contrast to, again, some other ones we've done on, on, on Belgium or, 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 or um, Kenya or whatever else. Okay. Under these auspices, Japan and Korea create a treaty in 1876, which sets up Japanese trade in Korea, giving Japanese enterprises preferences on the peninsula, including territorial rights. It also, many Koreans like this because it also frees Korea from being, at the time, what many considered a protectorate of China. There is resistance to this, however. There was an incident called the Emo Incident. It's, it's led by uh, Dai Wangun. Um, Dai Wangun, excuse me. He even attacked. They even attacked a Japanese force um, and the Japanese legation in 1882. It briefly restored, for just a minute, uh, the prior dynasty and the prior prior relationships that existed with China. But eventually, this incident is going to lead to the Chinese catching Dai Wangun. Um, and a new treaty in 1882, which kind of reestablishes what had been established in reestablishes what had already been established in 1876. Meiji Japan pressured Korea to follow a certain path, but they were also competing with Qing Dynasty traditionalists from China, both in China as well as the ones that were loyal to them in Korea. This leads to something called the 1884 Gaspin coup, which ends up being thwarted by China. This was a coup, coup in which Japan was essentially trying to overthrow leadership, um, especially leadership that aligned itself with Qing Dynasty China, and, and China was able to put this coup down. 
The reason I mention this is a lot of what's going to inform um, the colonization of Korea is this competition between China and Japan, and eventually Russia is also going to get involved, over who should have a say-so in the peninsula. We might be able to argue that essentially there are three colonial powers seeking to control Korea. And it is this competition which is going to make this case study super interesting. Again, China, Russia, and Japan. Obviously, Japan's going to win out, spoiler alert, but we're going to talk about how that happens. Another important event during this era is the Donghak Rebellion, which takes place in 1894. And, and real quickly, essentially, peasants are upset with the imperial abuses of a certain magistrate of Gabu, or Gobu, excuse me. Um, some of these abuses included uh, labor abuses, various projects that they didn't necessarily agree with, heavy taxation, and of course, settlement. They launch a revolt in 1894, and the capital city of Seoul ends up turning to China for help to put down this rebellion. China sends in 2,700 troops. The reason this is important is when you reach out to China to put down a peasant revolt, China is obviously not necessarily going to want to do this for free. This is going to give them um, rationales for various, I would say less so colonial, but more imperial enterprises in, 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 in Korea. Japan obviously see this as a violation of the treaties we just got done talking about, most notably the 1882 treaty. They end up asking the Qing help to reform the Korean government and are met with refusal. So essentially, China's willing to help put down the rebellion with 2,700 troops, but they're not interested in reforming the Korean government. Why might China not want to help reform the Korean government, even though they're willing to help Korea put down its own peasant revolts? Do you, and again, Nick's coming into this with not, not necessarily the background knowledge, but I just want him to kind of like think about this. What would China, what would hold China back from wanting to do this? I mean, the fact that there are two other significant powers at play with interests in the area, right, is the only thing I can think of. They don't want to piss off Japan and Russia, right? So they're trying to keep that. Well, and it doesn't actually work. It's, it's kind of funny that you mentioned it. it doesn't actually work because the very next year, Japan and China do go to war mainly over this issue. In 1895, we have the first Sino-Japanese war in 1895. China, perhaps maybe a little bit arrogant, perhaps thought Japan was bluffing in terms of some of their like ramp up militarily in the peninsula, or perhaps they were listening to their various Western advisors who told them not to worry, ends up, and <clears throat> in my own words, getting its ass handed to it by the Japanese military um, in this first Sino-Japanese war. Japan successfully ends up completing the put down of the previously mentioned Dongak rebels and installs a pro-Japanese government in Seoul. This is important because again, certain people within the Korean government had asked China to help them reform their government. Well, Japan doesn't give them that option. They, they reform the government, but it ends up being a government that is very pro-Japan. They end up fully occupying the capital city of Seoul. They push the Chinese out of the entire northern part of the peninsula. They keep going as they continue to push, push the Chinese out, out of the northern part of the peninsula and invade uh, Manchuria. They capture an important port called Port Arthur, where they massacre 2,600 people. Um, they then go on to capture the Pescadores, uh, Pescadores Islands. Uh, again, excuse my pronunciation. They go on to win Taiwan in negotiations as well, which is super interesting because the history of Taiwan is, well, to be blunt, super interesting. Don't have time to get into it now, but how many hands is or how many people have had their hands on Taiwan at one point or another? Well, Japan has it at this point. Um, the treaty that ends all of this is called the Treaty of Shimonosek Shimonoseki in 1895. Korea, in this treaty, is given what we might call a fake autonomy. Um, also, during this time period, Queen Min, Korean Queen Min, is assassinated by the Japanese. This has actually been proven later uh, by, two, by Russian documents. Um, in 2001, they, these documents were held in the Russian legations um, in Korea at this point in time. There was always question for the last, I don't know, century or so who actually assa assassinated the queen, but recently it's been proven it was J the Japanese. Um, that assassination would have been because of her favoritism shown towards the Qing dynasty in China. Korean nationalists under Daewongun, who we already talked about in the various rebellions, moves the 
surviving king, Gojong, to the Russian legation during this period of time in an attempt to rule in response. So essentially, after all of these events and after the first Sino-Japanese War, what you see is a little bit of competition on the peninsula. You have the pro-Japan government established in Seoul, but they establish it. It's, it's, it's them establishing this government. And then you have a rival government that is somewhat pro-Korean nationalism, but also prefers the Chinese Qing dynasty to Japan, now ruling from the Russian legation on the peninsula. Um, I, it, I don't know that I should ask, but I'm going to ask anyway. Any thoughts about the complexity of, of what I attempted to just describe? I mean, it definitely lends itself to instability in the region, more so than is already going on, obviously. The last gap at a... Um, uh, autonomous Korea during this period of time is the establishment of the Korean Empire, basically taking over for the dynasty. It's established in 1897 after all of the events we just went through with the last Joseon heir. King Gojong uses the instability that Nick just talked about, um, as well as Russian and Japanese meddling, as well as the extreme popularity of post-enlightenment ideology to claim authority. There is a, a interesting club at this point in time called the Independence Club that was established in Korea. Well, obviously the name gives it away. It seeks independence, but it seeks independence under, to be blunt, Western Enlightenment ideals, nationalism, economic liberalism, etc. Things we talked about that had already taken place excuse me, in Meiji, Japan, um, which is also informing some of the problematic strategies we're seeing Japan um, engage in right now. Also during this time, past are something called the Guangmu reforms. They mirror many of the Meiji policies in Japan that sought a synthesis of Western ideals with modernism, but, but not necessarily just adopting them full-blown as Western, taking the parts they like and synthesizing them with Korean nationalist traditionalism. We see this happen over and over again. I would argue what I talked about with the Meiji Restoration was even part of this. They'll take some of these things, modern militaries, modern taxation systems, perhaps even parliamentary forms of political structures, but then merging them with a very traditionalist and sometimes ultra-nationalist understanding, um, which is very interesting. There were also rebellions that really never stopped, continuing throughout 1888. These rebellions ended up, ended up leading to the banning of the Independence Club and all other non-state, quote-unquote, congresses. Um, so the Independence Club ends up being banned during this period of time because many people in positions of power, whether they were pro-China, pro-Russia, or pro um um, Japan saw them as challenging their interests there because, again, a fully independent Korea, I mean, it means they don't necessarily get to prey upon the resources and labor available to them on the peninsula. Um, I will add that during this period of time, most of the foreign affairs did heavily favor the Russians. Um, and the Russians, whether it was out of the goodness of their heart or whatever, were were renowned in Korea for training Korean military, um, for trade agreements, for offering projects and infrastructure help um, with um, nece not necessarily the same expectations on return um, as China or Japan. Again, I don't have time to get fully into like, like czarist Russia and its attempts at colonial or imperial enterprises, but in Korea at this time, many saw them as more favorable than China or Japan. Which leads us to another war, a very famous war, probably more famous than the uh, Sino-Japanese War. It's the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905. Japan itself was growing quite weary of Russia's impact on Korea. It asked them to give it up in exchange for Manchurian influence. So eventually they go to Russia, say, hey, stop messing around in Korea. We'll give you, a, we'll give you some, some influence in Manchuria instead. Russia says hard pass. And Japan goes on to surprise attack the Russian fleet at Port Arthur and more or less win the full-scale war. I, I get that that's probably a, a controversial thing for me to say. Many think the Russo-Japanese war ended in kind of a uh, an impasse, maybe a standoff. But the fact that Japan held their own against Russia is a big victory. And this actually has profound effects on Russia and leads to the earliest form of Russian revolution in 1905 and later on, of course, the more famous one in 1917. In terms of impacts here, though, on the Korean Peninsula, um, it leads to the Treaty of Portsmouth. And in this case, Portsmouth, Maine. Yes, Maine in the United States. Teddy Roosevelt's there hanging out. He even wins the Nobel Prize for negotiating, helping negotiate this peace. This treaty forces Russia to essentially cede influence 
um, in Korea to Japan, which is another reason why I might argue technically Japan gets what they want out of this. So they win the war. Um, Japan forces Korea to sign over its protectorate status in 1905, um, which means Korea itself will be a protect protectorate of the Japan. Of, excuse me, protectorate of Japan. This type of language is similar to what we see Europeans doing in places like Africa or the Middle East or even Southeast Asia at the time. And again, it's kind of following very similar lines of international thinking. In other words. This is a way for Japan to get the international recognition as an up-and-coming colonial and imperial power. Um, they also immediately introduced 25 reforms in Korea that replaced many of the key advisors with Japanese advisors. They reduced the Korean military to a mere 1,000 troops. Obviously, this is for for to, to basically keep Korea from potentially resisting this, this occupation. I mean, the protectorate status is really an occupation, a full-blown occupation. The uh, King Gojon's last effort at this point in time to maintain some sort of autonomy in Korea is he sent secret emissaries to The Hague itself to voice the concerns about what was taking place um, after the Russo-Japanese War. Japan finds out that he sent these secret emissaries to The Hague to voice these concerns to the international community and has him removed from power. Formal colonization of Korea by Japan begins in 1910. At this point, the Japanese Minister of War, uh, Tarachi Masataki, pushes Korean Prime Minister, the Korean Prime Minister at this point, to sign the Japan-Korea Treaty of 1910, which essentially states, and I quote, His Majesty, the Emperor of Korea, concedes completely and definitely his entire sovereignty over the whole Korean territory to His Majesty, the Emperor of Japan, and His Majesty, the Emperor of Japan, accepts the concession stated in the previous article and consents to the annexation of Korea and the Empire of Japan. Masataki is given position um, in Korea as the Governor General, um, which is a position that would remain intact through all the way through World War II. Alongside other popular colonial justifications that we've already talked about, both ideological and material, there is a growing narrative, though, that that in my research was super interesting to me that, to be blunt, I, I had not learned about. And I think I want to dig into this just a little bit. This narrative that part of the Japanese process of what they're doing in, 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 in Korea isn't just about civilizing or teaching or, or even priest-patron relations we talked about with China and Tibet and so on and so forth. There is this argument called the sanita sanitization argument. Have you heard of this argument before, Nick? Nope. Okay. In sum, Japan saw one of its imperial duties in the modernization, quote unquote, of Korea was to literally clean it up, especially the capital city of Seoul. A 2005 collection of ethnographic sources revealed this overlooked rationale. So I'm going to go through three examples um, excuse me, four examples, um, as primary, well, not primary sources, three of them are primary sources. One of them is the secondary source um, that we looked at by, by uh, Todd Henry. He wrote this in 2005. He called it the sanitizing empire. He had this to say, he says, the writing of Korean culture in turn encouraged urban interventions to count colonized bodies, collect their excrement and convert this human by byproduct into fertilizer for increased agricultural production. He attempted to tame, uh, attempted to tame the strange uh, particularities of the colonized with a familiarizing discourse of statistics. This imaginary of a controllable indigenous reality also permeate, permeated the pages of Japan's early 20th century guides to colonial Seoul, which sought to represent this potential immigration and tourist site as salubrious, modern, and progressive by representationally displacing outside the city the dirty, defecating Korean of the ethnograph ethnographic and unimmer enumerative discourses. I'm going to provide three examples, and then I want Nick's thoughts on these. So some of the examples that Henry was able to uncover, or one of them I uncovered on my own, um, are quite interesting. So let's go through them. The first one comes to us from Isabella Bishop in 1897. Um, Bishop has this to say, one of the quote-unquote sites of Seoul is the steam or drain or water course, a wide walled open conduit along which a dark-colored festering stream slowly drags its malodorous length among manure and refuse heaps, which cover up most of what was once its shingly bed. There, tired crowds, masculine solely, slow, solely 
One may be refreshed by the sight of women of the poorest class, some ladling into pails the compound which passes for water, and others washing clothes in the fetid pools which pass for a stream. That's quite descriptive um, and, to be blunt, quite disgusting. But this is a Western lens looking at, 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 at Korea. Do not think that the Japanese were not aware, if, again, trying to compete on a world stage for imperial prowess, do not think they, did, they, they didn't take this seriously when others from, from the people they were competing with would come and make these observations of their colonial possessions. They want to clean this up. They're trying to get this image. Now, Seoul itself isn't nearly as disgusting as described here. We'll get to that in just a second. But this is the image that Japan is trying to, quote unquote, combat during the era. Here's another example. This comes to us from uh, Arakawa Goru in 1906. And I quote, but if you look closely at Koreans, they appear to be a bit vacant, their mouths open and their eyes dull, somehow lacking. In their lines of their mouths and faces, you can discern a certain looseness. And when it comes to sanitation and sickness, they are loose in the extreme. Indeed, to put it in the worst terms, one can even say that they are closer to beasts than to human beings. So this is now a Japanese lens, basically saying, like, because of what they observe in terms of sanitation, they're now comparing Koreans to beasts. The third example is also interesting. This comes to us from a Japanese professor, um, uh, Natobi Inazo. Um, and he had this to say, when I saw Prince Ito in Seoul, and when I told him that the population in Korea had not increased in the last hundred years, and that perhaps the Korean race was destined to disappear, he said, well, I'm not sure. I wish to see whether good laws will increase the, physio- uh, I, this word is going to throw me, throw me, throw me for a loop. Fecundity. Fecundity, thank you, of the Korean people. In Formosa, it was a very well-known fact that without new recruits coming from the mainland of China, the population would diminish. There were more deaths than births, but since we assume sovereignty there, annual returns show a gradual increase of births over deaths. Hence, as I said, the third great point in the colonial policy of Japan is the protection of health. Now, they use the example here of of Formosa, which essentially is Taiwan, which again was awarded way back in the 1890s to, to Japan. Um, But they're saying they could do the same thing in Korea. That's the goal. And if they basically clean up, they'll be able to essentially make more Koreans. Now, why do they care about making more Koreans? Perhaps it's for labor exploitation, things along those lines. But they do see this as part of their their cleaning up mission. Um, These observations do tend to ignore the great strides that Seoul had already taken in cleaning up and modernizing the city long before annexation. I had mentioned that, that, that with the help of Russians or perhaps the Qing dynasty or even certain Westerners that showed up in the, in the form of the U.S. or the French or whoever, that they had already started to make these reforms themselves in an attempt to modernize. The, J- the Japanese didn't necessarily introduce these ideals to Korea. And again, Seoul was no more, quote unquote, disgusting than any other city of the 19th century, probably globally speaking. But Japan or Japanese observers specifically look to these, what, what, what shortfalls it may have had, as a rationale for the colonial process. They reveal measurable rationales to justify, quote unquote, intervention, but they cover up the underlying motives. And these underlying motives are spatial control and political control in the name of profit. For example, one of the things that that helped them profit here is all of the waste that they collected was then given to Japanese merchants and sold to the countryside and massive profit margins to manufacture fertilizer for the rural um, farming industry. Regardless, I think um, it's important to note that an entire association is created to kind of move this process along. It's a very famous um, organization in Korean history. It's called the Seoul Sanitation Association, and it's established, or the SSA, to quote-unquote enforce Japanese hygienic standards to individual Korean households. The colonial police intruded into private spaces of Korean homes, surveying hygienic conditions and collecting sanitation fees. In this case, brute force was employed by the colonial force to infor- by the colonial police to enforce the Japanese discourse on sanitization. Japanese colonial ideolo- ideology worked through both knowledge production and brute force. So this is a policing institution that is policing sanitation and allowing the Japanese police essentially to basically go into people's homes and do whatever they feel like they need to do if they deem them quote unquote unclean. Okay, we've gotten through this whole kind of interesting take on colonial rationale. What are your thoughts? I know it's a generic question, but but it's one that we haven't necessarily gone through in any of our other case studies, the specific sanitation argument. And it makes me think of 
two things. The first is dehumanization, right? Like even the one person said they're closer to beasts than they are to humans, right? As a result of the way that they're living. So it functions, it performs that function for sure, which then functions to justify, right, the colonial actions. The other thing it makes me think of is Foucault's governmentality, right? Which we've done a video on it talking about. But this idea of quantifying all of the people, right? And counting and collecting and directing and controlling and like, et cetera, right? They're enforcing this, this, the method through which they're doing all this is governmentality, right? Using statistics, et cetera, to control the people's lives. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it. It's crazy. Yeah, well, and it marks um, what we call the beginning of the military police era, which lasts until 1919. So this period is marked by, to be blunt, literal rule of the Japanese imperial military with little to no checks on their power and intrusion. So these aren't even politicians or or people with a rich history of leadership. These are these are military individuals, which are, that's probably fine, I guess, if we're in a, I don't know, if we're talking about the Sino-Japanese War, the Russo-Japanese War, they're probably really good at winning wars. I don't know that they're very good at administering a colonial um, property, in this case, uh, Korea. During this time, thousands of arrests were taking place. There is a very legalist interpretation of punishment. There's numerous disappearances. Um, as we just talked about with the SSA, there are home invasions um, and even outright killings. Um, I guess I'll ask one more question real quickly from an ideology standpoint. Why would legalism appeal to the Japanese imperial military? I think the question's kind of obvious, but I'd, I'd like a cap on it. Why would legalism as an ideology, again, that ideology has, has, has a very rich history in, in mm -hmm. Asia as well, why would that appeal to the Japanese imperial military as they begin this occupation of Korea? I mean, they can implement laws that justify what they're doing and make opposition to them a violation of law, right? And and it lacks nuance, it lacks context. It's, yeah, it's it's just very quick. Like the law says X, Y, or Z, you broke it, we get to do thing these things, okay? They also introduced um, cadastral surveys, which led to a further divide and rule between the pre-existing castes in Korea, which I've already mentioned 20, 30 minutes ago, which favored Korean landlords over tenants, but also new Japanese landlords over Korean landlords. So essentially they antagonized class conflict that already exists in Korea and was indigenous to Korea as it attempted to quote unquote modernize on its own. So, so it's not as if Korea wasn't aware of these class antagonisms and wasn't looking at things through perhaps its own, own Marxist lens. It's that Japan amplifies these issues, these class antagonisms. And I must stress this, um, I haven't referenced it yet, but there are obviously numerous surveys um, and analyses that look at what part of the Korean elite were willing to sell out Korea to Japan. And, and like many colonial enterprises, they needed help. The, J Japan needed the help of certain Koreans, Korean elite, to implement some of the more divisive um, or controlling features of their imperial process. So again, there were Koreans that were willing to, to, to work with the Japanese on this. That, that, that happens in every colonial process. You need certain members of the local community that are willing to sell out others within that community, right? Sell out their, their compatriots. Anyway, Wei finds, who we've already mentioned a couple of times, finds that in Marxist terms, the cadastral, surve uh, cadastral survey initiated a capitalist process, capitalist process of primitive accumulation in Korea. Through making land ownership singular and commodifying land, the Japanese colonial government made Korean land legible to the Japanese capitalist machine. Meanwhile, as tenants were denied their traditional tenant rights to land, they were deprived of their means of production. Without ownership to land, tenants could not control the fruits of their labor and act seek advancement through their hard work, which again is, is where we lead to something else called alienation if we're going to use this Marxist lens right here. I also want listeners to keep in mind that by 1910, 170,000 Japanese settlers, Nikkei, were already in Korea and claiming lands. And again, prior treaties that we talked about dating all the way back to like 1876 gave those Japanese settlers favoritism in claiming these lands, these property rights. Um, the surveys I just got done talking about um, in 1906 allowed for Japanese purchases and all land had to be verified through written documentation, which left Koreans, both wealthy and poor, reliant on older agreements exposed to nullification of claims. 
what I'm essentially saying here is that if we go back to feudal eras in Korea in which many of these agreements were made, they were bound by word, word of mouth, not necessarily like contracts. So when the Japanese show up and start to introduce these contracts, I mean, they can make up, make up anything they want on the contracts because now it's, of course, written down and they can disenfranchise, again, even wealthy landlord Koreans if they want by saying, well, we now have this contract and we have this deed to this land and these are the relations that we're going to have with, of course, the peasants that have been working the land. And if you were even a wealthy Korean and didn't have this documentation, you were, you were shit out of luck. Um, which is kind of interesting. So what you have in this time is a growing landless class um, of Koreans, which are going to be forced to work um, on various infrastructure projects that are going to be introduced by Japan. And of course, these projects are going to be the ones that we've seen in every colonial case study where the colonizer is going to pat themselves on the back for modernizing the country, right? Dams and irrigation and sanitation and farming and all these other things. But none of these things actually help the indigenous, quote unquote, population. They're meant to help the colonial power more efficiently um, um, process its resources. By 1932, over half of all of the arable land in Korea was owned by Japanese citizens or corporations, which again is an astounding number, but these are numbers that we've seen in, in so many other case studies that we've talked about. I, Cuba rings, rings a bell right now, like in which, which I, I believe by the time the Cuban revolution broke out, I think, um, it was something like 70 to 80% of the land, um, was owned by foreigners in Cuba. Um, which again, super interesting. Now I want to stress that, um, there was agency here, um, by Koreans. It's not that, and in, in, in every colonial case study, there is agency by the colonized. The righteous armies were a long-standing form of Korean resistance that 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 actually dates back. I mean, I mean, as as far as I think the Middle Ages, maybe even before that. But in terms of what we're talking about, this long-standing tradition of Korean righteous armies, as they were called. Um, are important. The most modern form of the righteous, uh, righteous army um, started to coalesce around ultra-nationalist ideals in the late 1800s. Um, so we talked about Dai Wong Gun. Um, those ideals are important because, again, we're framing a a Korean modernity that adopts certain understandings through the lens of, of, of Western Enlightenment ideals, but with a a traditional look at the Korean culture and who they were um, as, as part of the emphasis and part of the rationale. Japanese records um, in the Botu Tobatsu Shi, which translates roughly as the annals of the subjugation of the insurgent, which is important. Like these are their own records of how they subjugated the righteous armies between 1907 and 1908, um, report about 1,000, not even about, I have the exact number, 1,908 atta um, attacks were made by what could be called righteous armies. Not necessarily all organized or working together, but by a various set of, I guess in modern terms, we'd call them independence-minded militias. The Japanese recorded almost 2,000 attacks by them just between 1907 and 1908. That, that's that's 2,000 attacks in a year. Um, and during this period of time, international arms dealers that were either allowed to or sometimes not allowed to were still making forays into the Korean peninsula, and they were making a killing on selling these righteous armies um, as many arms as they could. They weren't necessarily the most advanced or most modern weapons they could find. Sometimes they were like, you know, leftover Russian Russian guns or Russian ammunition, things along those lines, or sometimes even Chinese. But they were making a killing selling to the righteous armies because the righteous armies spent so much time resisting this Japanese occupation. Occupation. Now, in terms of who who were in these righteous armies, it was an actually a very eclectic mix of Koreans. So, some resistance movements were were not eclectic mixes. It was, for for example, in Kenya, it was predominantly the Kikuyu, right? Like that was the that become the Mao Wow. But but in Korea, it was people from all walks of life that were resisting um, the Japanese occupation. Many were from the former Korean army, which, as I've already mentioned, was more or less disbanded by Japan. Again, a thousand troops were allowed to remain in service, but but the rest, of course, had all been told to go to go um, to go kick sand. And essentially, they formed many of these righteous armies. Their closest defeat of Japanese forces was led were led by a individual named Yi In Yong, and 
he was able to amass 10,000 troops and they came within 12 kilometers of actually occupying Seoul with a righteous army, but they could not crack the final Japanese counter offensive, which was led by 20,000 Japanese troops. Um, Plus they had the backing um, of artillery from ships um, docked nearby, Um, which again, at that time, if you're getting shelled from these boats from from, from kilometers away, that's it's very tough to crack through that and then also deal with ground troops. Essentially, two more years of fighting um, from 1908 on um, led left 17,000 Koreans dead in their resistance to Japanese occupation, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, anything that you want to add regarding the resistance or the agency of Koreans against their, their um, occupation? It's an important point, right, that you mentioned already that we we oftentimes don't hear enough about the fact that in every colonial process, there was resistance to that process, right? There was agency on behalf of those that were being subjugated. That's often left out of the narrative, right? Never once has anyone ever been colonized gone willingly, right? Like not a single time in human history. Speaking of agency, this leads us to perhaps the most famous version of agency in in this uh, part of Korean history. It's called the March 1st Movement or Sam Il. Um, a lot of the sources I combed over painted this March 1st Movement as directly informed by the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson in the post-World War I era, this idea, excuse me, this very idealistic understanding of what the world could look like going forward after World War I and to make sure that another world war um, never happens again, obviously <laughs> failed miserably. Um, and, and even the United States itself really didn't adopt the 14 points. In fact, we'll, that's one of Wilson's failures is it didn't adopt these and even join the League of Nations. It didn't do any of these things. But but regardless, I, I struggle with this a little bit because again, it gives the West a little bit too much credit here in fostering agency that had already been decades, if not centuries old. That's why I wanted to talk about the Righteous Armies first and this idea that Korea was already actively trying to remove the Japanese colonizer long before a U.S. president gives a famous speech. I'm going to mention it anyway, because again, a lot of the research that I combed over mentions it, so I feel compelled to, to situate the context here. The, the main point that is often cited from, from Wilson's 14 that perhaps motivated some Korean resistance was point number five in the long list. I am not going through the whole list, but point number five in particular is, and I quote, a free and open-minded and absolutely impar- impartial adjustment of all colonial claims based upon a strict observance of the, of the principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty, the interests of the populations concerned must have equal weight with the equitable government whose title is to be determined. It's obviously legalese, but what, what, what Wilson is essentially saying here is that the colonized should have as much they, their their idea should factor as much into what a new nation will look like as those that are in positions of power, which must also be left open to determination. He, he argues that in many of these cases, it wouldn't be determined. At least that's how I read it. Do you, do you read it a little bit differently? No, that's pretty much it, I think. Okay. In 1919, Perhaps motivated by this, but again, I do want to stress, I think also there's just this, this, this internal agency that already existed in Korea. 33 activists end up reading aloud, um, and I'm not going to get this right, but Ko, Ko Nam Sion's Korean Declaration of Independence from a small restaurant in Seoul. And one of the important opening par- thoughts within this Declaration of Independence is, and I quote, we herewith proclaim the independence of Korea and the liberty of the Korean people. This we proclaim to all the nations of the world in witness of human equality. This we proclaim to our descendants so that they may enjoy in perpetuity their inherent right to nationhood. Inasmuch as this proclamation originates from our 5,000 year history, inasmuch as it springs from the loyalty of 20 million people, inasmuch as it affirms our yearning for the advancement of everlasting liberty, inasmuch as it expresses our desire to take part in the global reform rooted in human consciousness, it is the solemn will of heaven, the great tide of our age, and a act and a just act necessary for the coexistence of all humankind. Therefore, no power in this world can obstruct or suppress it. I do think this quote is important, and I do think this quote does 
speak to the potential inspiration drawn from from the 14 points, but also earlier Enlightenment ideals, but also this idea when we're talking about a 5,000 year history, this appeal to a Korean culture and a Korean identity um, that is unique, but also unique within a fabric of world cultures that is seeking its own understanding or that are seeking their own understanding of themselves and how this fabric can work together um, on, again, a global level. Um, to seek equality, I don't know. I mean, that's what I'm picking up from this this declaration. Um, anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, it ties to, it situates itself within the long, rich history, like it says here, right, this 5,000-year history and existing ideals for, like, an independent future, right? I mean, that's kind of the point here. It hits, touches on all points. Now, moving from our colonial case study lens to the lens that kind of founded this actual channel, resistance and revolution, um, there was a strategy behind this. These activists chose to only read um, in the small restaurant in Seoul, knowing that they were going to eventually publish this and make this more public in a different way to essentially make oppression backfire. Um, And if you've listen to some of our other episodes on, on revolutionary strategy and things along those lines, that's that's something that we've talked about quite a bit. Under police military rule, they end up notifying the police of this public message in order to get arrested publicly. Why would you want to eventually get arrested by the Japanese um, police at this point in time? What's the point in getting arrested if you're trying to foment this agency? I mean, it's propaganda of the deed, right? So it's, it's generating... Generating eyeballs, right? Spreading the movement, gaining followers in theory. Hopefully. Spectacle. Um, yeah. Okay. So through various broadcasts and pamphleteering, again, we've talked about this in numerous causes of resistance over time and space, pamphleteering, they end up outlining the major issues that um, that they found Um with the Japanese occupation. First and foremost, employment. We already talked about the contracts and how the economy had changed um, relatively quickly. Favoritism that was shown to either certain Korean elite that were willing to sell out other Koreans to the Japanese, or of course, favoritism to Japanese workers. They also saw corruption within the government. Heavy taxation was another thing they cited as a huge problem. Another huge problem was the suppression of Korean culture. Another huge problem they mentioned were the land confiscations. Again, we've already talked about that. Also a forced labor system, which I'll dig into a little bit more later, and outright discrimination. Some of these obviously have interplay and 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 and, and intersectionality, but others are, of course, important as standalone um, issues that many Koreans are going to cite over time and space that they're going to try and challenge. There was a second more popular reading of the Declaration of Independence, at Pagoda Park, and this was by uh, Chung Jae Young, and this one was attended by thousands. And this shows how quickly momentum had built after the arrests of the initial activists. This second reading um, caused the thousands of listeners to begin marching um, through Seoul. These marches end up turning into protests when they were uh, met with, of course, police violence. These violent reprisals led to, in some cases, an outright massacre in many of the places as, again, the the marches spread throughout Seoul and then, of course, throughout other cities. Uh, As the day passes, essentially 1,500 demonstrations broke out. Um, over the coming days, resulting in 7,509 deaths at the hands of Japanese police. 15,849 Koreans would be wounded, and 46,303 would be arrested by the imperial police. These figures come to me from Park uh, Yun-sik in what is called The Bloody History, a book um, on this occupation period. It's also during this time that we want to give shout out to, again, agency in a channel that that prides itself in talking a lot about resistance and revolution. One of the more over, well, not overlooked anymore. There are actually a, a number of different memorials dedicated to her, but one of the previously overlooked heroes of this time period and eventually martyrs is uh, a young woman named Yu Guansun, um, and she only lived from 1902 to 1920. So she she died very early in life, only 18 years old. She actually got started in a March 5th demonstration, so four days after the initial March 1st stuff begins. 
She ends up being arrested, but released after her school officials negotiated her release. They had a little bit of sway because her school was, to be blunt, a, 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 I, I want to say a Protestant school. Long story short, there were Western ties there and were able to negotiate her, her release. She ends up going back to her own village, um, known as Yonduri. She ends up organizing, and again, she, she's a teenager, organizing a multi-village protest on April 1st, so a full month after the initial protest broke out. 3,000 people show up, and again, these are in smaller villages, so not necessarily in, in like downtown Seoul or anything along the lines. She's a powerful organizer to get this all done in, in, in a month while spending part of that month being arrested. The Japanese at this, um, the Japanese police at this uh, demonstration end up killing 19 people, including her parents. She ends up being arrested again. She's offered a plea deal that if she turned on other organizers, that she would be um, released or treated differently. She did not turn on them, and she ends up being tortured while being held by the Japanese police. She is already famous. Word of mouth is spread throughout Korea about her. Already famous. Um, which is important. Her steadfast, um, her steadfastness during her trial and the accusations she unleashed that I guess were, were very well worded for the time against the Japanese occupation turned her into a symbol of the resistance. Um, organized pro, she also organized protests in prison while she was being held. Um, and because of the protests she was organizing in, in prison, she ends up being beaten to death there. Um, and there's a quote that comes to us from a later article written about her in the New York Times. So I'm trusting that the New York Times did its work to get this primary source because I did not find this, this primary source myself. I'll, I'll, I'm going to cite my sources here. She says, even if my fingernails are torn out, my nose and ears are ripped apart and my legs and arms are crushed, this physical pain does not compare to the pain of losing my nation. My only remorse is not being able to do more than dedicating my life to my country. And of course, she ends up passing away. But this martyrdom, of course, is going to be legion throughout the country. I will say March 1st is very important, but to be blunt, it's not initially successful. Japan, however, it's not successful, I will say, in getting Korea its autonomy and freedom from Japan. I will say it's successful in getting the international community to look a little bit more closely at what Japan was doing in Korea. And again, if Japan is very conscious of its image on a global stage as an enlightened civilizer, um, they're going to take this international scrutiny um, a little bit more ser seriously. And they do end up softening some of their policies, again, under pressures from outsiders to be seen more as this this enlightened civilizer rather than this oppressive colonial power that we would have seen in the 17 or 1800s, which I, I don't know what that means. I mean, does that mean anything? What do you think? No. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Doesn't mean necessarily anything. Many of the activists of March 1st um, and the ensuing protests are forced to flee Korea um, and end up in Manchuria. And there they continue to organize. A provisional government of Korea is established in Shanghai, which, by the way, is not in Manchuria per se, but it is established in Shanghai. Um, I will argue that the Chinese, I mean, it's interesting that they allow a provisional government of Korea to establish itself in China. Again, it is not a unique situation. We we saw this with the Tibet um, and China example, but in this case, it was India that allowed a provisional government to be established in its country. Um do you think countries like this are doing this out of the kindness of their heart? What do you think? Does China have a, a play here? I mean, obviously not. Obviously, they're not doing it out of the kindness of their heart. They, they have something to gain, clearly, by doing this. I also want to be clear that despite some international scrutiny and despite the rhetoric of the 14 points, the allies, and when I say allies, we're in the post-World War era where they're somewhat working together. The allies are careful not to fully question Japan's right to Korea because Japan during World War I is technically what? It's an ally. So they're, they're, they're careful not to fully draw into critical inquiry Japan's right to be in Korea. Um, in fact, they actually refused to address the question as it was raised at the Paris Peace Conference um, around the same time period. There's also an interesting aside taking place that while I don't want to dig heavily into right now in this episode or this discussion, we will probably make a standalone on. 
There is an interplay here between Korean resistance movements and internal Japanese resistance movements. The J Japanese are not a monolith. Not every person in Japan is on board with the imperial Japan. There was resistance movements in Japan going against the Japanese empire. Many of them were from leftist thinkers. There was a socialist movement there, there was a communist movement there, and there was an anarchist movement there. The one that's most intriguing to me, as our listeners will know, is the anarchist movement um, that is taking place in Japan. There's a South Korean, uh, South Korean, I should just say Korean, we haven't got to the split yet, Korean man named Park Yol. He ends up moving to Tokyo after the March 1st protests, where he finds Japanese socialist and anarchist circles. And he himself Prompt, or it, prompted by them, forms a group called Futisha, which essentially translates as revolt. He meets a Japanese woman there named Kaneko Fumiku, who spent time in Korea as well. She had grown, being part of the colonizer, she had been in Korea, and they end up falling for each other. They end up working together to foment numerous anti-imperialist actions in Japan. I do want to stress this because this shows, again, that agency, but a different type of agency. And I just want to introduce it here that there are different layers to it. Some of it might be liberal economic layers. Some of it might be um, um, nationalist layers or far right layers. Well, in this case, we see leftist layers. And these layers are, and I must stress this, not just in Korea, but in Japan as well, that there were agents in Japan working to change the way Japan functioned at that time. Again, we'll probably dig more into this in a standalone episode um, when we look at Korean and Japanese anarchism. I don't know when that's coming, but I did want to mention it here that, that that's when the, this really gets going at the, at, at the beginning of the 20th century. So interesting. Uh, any thoughts on Jap Japanese Korean anarchism? Have you dug into it ever before? Nope. I hadn't heard of it before you told me about it, so. Okay. In terms of what's going on in Korea um, pre-World War II, one of the things that Japan sought to do in its softer colonial process after 1919 was to gain control over narrative. So despite a softer, more civil-minded rule and the removal of police leadership, um, Japan still sought, again, ideal and material hegemony through the manufacture of a colonial rationale. Um in contrast, it, it, it didn't necessarily lead to less agency by Koreans. One of the more famous examples of this is in 1929 when the Koshu students um, create an anti-Japanese movement, which was violently suppressed to include even incidents of a mass burning leading to hundreds of deaths, which led to some more martial conditions for some. I just use that as an example to say that Japan outwardly is saying to the rest of the world, like, we're still going to hang out here, but we're going to do it a little bit more softly. Um, but in reality, any sort of resistance was still met with insane amounts of violence. I mean, a mass burning of human beings in this case, students. Um, anyway, getting back to the point of control over narrative, one of the things that's created during this period of time is the Kore Korean History Compilation Committee that is formed by the governor general to weave together the history of Korea, but through a Japanese lens. So through this Japanese lens, they would begin archaeological projects, they would take Japanese artifacts, they would decide what's important about Korea's past and what can be learned. The reason this is important is this is common a, 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 among so many colonial projects where the colonizer will look to the history of the colonized, and oftentimes it's a very impressive history, maybe even a more impressive history than the colonizers. And they will then take what they want from that and then reweave together the story of that past that fits the Japanese narrative of what? Of uncivilized or, or perhaps a rationale for the punishment that these individuals are receiving right now. Um, and importantly, they literally steal the artifacts and bring them to the metropole, back to Japan, right? The artifacts of Korea's past. And they then basically get the get to japanize it J Jap Jap no, whatever the J japanification of korean history takes place at this point in time to give you another example of this the former former palace ends up being demolished by the japanese um to build their modern government building which is symbolism we are we are removing the 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 korean contributions to what happened on this peninsula and replacing them with the japanese again 
this isn't unique to this process. France and Egypt is a great example where the whole school of Egyptology is born because of a colonial process. And many people are like, well, that's great. We get to learn more about Egypt, but through whose lens? We're not learning it through the Egyptian lens. We're learning it to rationalize the Western present. Um, that's an easy example. We can see this with, with Native Americans being taught through, of course, a U.S. lens now, which is, I, I mean, completely absurd. Why do, am I missing something? Why do empires do this? What What is the point of whitewashing, or in this case, uh, Japanification of Korean history? I mean, I feel like that's a rhetorical question, right? Like it's so that they can control the narrative and they can delegitimize and subjugate the rich, lengthy histories that these places have, right? So they can denigrate the thousands of years of Korean history to justify their own colonial pursuits. Fair enough. We also have um, some other things taking place throughout the 1930s, besides, of course, control over narrative, although control over narrative remains the theme I'm going to keep keep going with for the next few minutes. The Juan Pochon incident of 1931 um, is an important case study in discussing how Japan tried to control narrative of what was going on in the colony. The incident itself isn't that big a deal. It's a dispute over irrigation rights in Manchuria between Korea and China, Korean and Chinese farmers. Well, at this point, Japan has a lot of control in Manchuria as well. So they're seeing them as, as quote unquote, both subjects in a way, but they favor their Korean subjects. A standoff takes place in which the Chinese farmers drive off Korean irrigation, digger, uh, uh, irrigation diggers who eventually the Koreans will be backed by the Japanese military, forcing the Chinese farmers to back off with some casualties and arrests. But that's the incident in a nutshell. I'm, I'm sure if you live through it, it's it's bigger deal than, than I just laid out. But for our purposes here, that's the incident. But more importantly than the incident itself is the fake news that was manufactured. Japan ordered all Korean publications to fabricate the events, make up Korean casualty counts, all to foment an anti-Chinese sentiment in Korea. It worked. Anti-Chinese riots broke out in Korea, protesting, saying that the Japanese essentially need to go get these, get these Chinese farmers and punish them for, for killing Koreans, which didn't really even happen. And in response in China, um, the Chinese also have riots breaking out against um, Koreans and, of course, the Japanese in this case, but this time it resulted in actual Korean casualties. Koreans um, were persecuted and many, of course, were killed in China during this period of time because of the news that was produced by Japan. And again, they ordered these publications to outright fabricate the events, um, which is, I mean, I, I guess a par for the course for this time period, I suppose. Um, another way that the Japanese tried to control narrative was the naming of names. Um, essentially, Koreans um, were previously disallowed to use Japanese-style surnames in earlier colonial processes because they thought that was the Koreans trying to gain favor by adopting Japanese-style surnames. But now, after they were not allowed to do that, as we get to the 1930s, they are now ordered to, to advance them past their traditional clan-based ID identities in an aim to assimilate them to completely remove them of their, their, their uh, past, to remove them from their familial and cultural and in their eyes, clan-based and antiquated past. That was the goal of the Japanese by forcing Koreans to adopt the Japanese naming system. Is there a net positive during the 1920s and 1930s? Um, many look, many colonial apologists look to the education system. So I will briefly mention here to try and at least appear balanced. Um, the positive education, um, it is the Japanese implement the first free public education system in Korea. This education system went from primary to secondary to high school to even a university that's established at Keijo. Um, it is a highly regimented educational system based on the Japanese system. But the goal was, and I quote, to form the imperial citizen. I'll also add that it wasn't um, equitable in terms of gender until 1938. They, women were not really included until then. It also meant to undermine previous private schools, which either cultivated, in the Japanese terms, Korean patriotism or a Western-centric ethos. So that's interesting. They didn't want these private schools, again, especially religious schools, if we're talking about um, Christian missionary schools, they didn't want them to have nearly the impact on the Korean population that, of course, the Japanese education system did. Um, 
Now, I will say that in these schools, unlike other case studies, this is where these case studies deviate a little bit, that both Korean and Japanese were taught. That's interesting because in other examples, like in Tibet, it, it, Tibetan eventually is, is a language that, that ends up being thrown out by the colonizer. Or um, when we talk about the Kurds, Turkey uh, disallowed Kurdish as a language for, for decades and decades and decades. I mean, there's numerous examples of this. Uh, I mean, shoot, Native American boarding schools in the United States, one of our favorite examples. Of course, you were not allowed to speak your indigenous language there. You were punished greatly for speaking your indigenous language. So I could argue that the Japanese were a little bit more lenient on this specific topic Topic that they they taught both Korean and Japanese. Um, although I will add that there was usually a reverence towards the teacher-student relations in terms of the two cultures. So you, while you might learn a little bit of Korean culture in Korea in a Japanese school, there was always this idea that it was still subservient to the Japanese culture. This this rethinking of Korean history and Japanese history in the interplay was called uh, Toyoshi at the time. At its peak. Though, even with this education system before World War II, only 38% of the Koreans were in the education system, even though it was free. Um, so I guess I got to ask the question, what were the other 62% relegated to? Well, all of the various labor and irrigation projects and farming projects that, that, that we have already talked about and some of that I'm about to talk about here. Anyway, I do want your thoughts on this education system that is implemented by the Japanese. And I want your thoughts specifically on modern apologists. Japanese and others alike have kind of said, even Koreans alike have said, this was an important improvement to Korean society. I, I, what do you think of this as a colonial apology? I mean, this is super common, right? Even like totalitarian dictators, people will look back and be like, oh, but they completely like revolutionized the education system, right? Like this is the one thing that is like a commonality in almost all colonial processes that some apologists can look back on and claim like this was the, this was an improvement. It wasn't all bad, right? Sure. And like you said, right, maybe it wasn't all bad. Right, the, implementing this education system, though clearly in every colonial process, the education that's being given to the colonized is clearly from whatever the, the lens of the colonizer, right? And like you said, it's removing their agency, it's removing their culture. They're oftentimes not allowed to speak their own language, right? They're oftentimes given different names, which you just mentioned, right? So it's never, it's never like the colonizer moves in, creates an education system that completely celebrates everything they're traditional about the colonized, right? And their history and culture and language, et cetera. That literally is never the case. Speaking of agency, though, that you brought up, I'm going to touch on that. There was a brief attempt, not even a brief, I, I, that's not giving it credit. I would say a long lasting attempt at reclaiming a narrative from Korean um, producers of knowledge at this time. This idea of Minjok. Um, it is admittedly an idea that is ultra-nationalist and a racial understanding of a Korean identity historically tied to a mythical descendants from, from an ancient god hero known as uh, Dangun. It is also part of a rejection of a traditionalist Neo-Confucian identity that had been in Korea since, I, as I mentioned, like, like 1300s when we started this episode, because that too was too Chinese oriented. So we're challenging a Japanese understanding of Korean identity and we're challenging a Chinese understanding of, 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 of a Korean identity. And they argued essentially that's because both Japan and China historically have placed Korea as subservient. Sometimes they'll they'll look at themselves as the enlightened liberators, or they'll, that's how they'll paint themselves. But 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 if you look at the actual history, this Minjok identity argued that both have always placed Korea as subservient, um, and that's not a correct way to view Korea if we're going to move forward. Um, which is interesting. I just want to give mention that there was also an attempt, if we're talking about narrative and framing narrative throughout the 1920s and 30s, there was Korean resistance to the Japanese um, framing of narrative. Also, interestingly enough, Christianity makes some heavy forays into the peninsula um, during this time in terms of making progress and gaining a lot of converts. The reason many, um, well, at least some of the sources I, I combed over cited um, was not necessarily the effectiveness of missionaries in Korea. It was, they saw it as a better alternative to Japanese assimilation. So painted between two potential belief systems, they argued that Christianity um, was favorable to Japanese assimilation given the actions of the Japanese in Korea. So just interesting, interesting asides there. 
as far as the topic of material now, so we talked about the ideal during the 1920s and 30s. Let's talk about the material. Japan forced, of course, modernization and industrialism throughout this period, um, which is interesting. Some, some, some sources cite this as a unique situation in which industry was also put into the colony. Many colonial relationships don't actually industrialize or at least heavily industrialize the colony because they want to leave that colony dependent on, on the home country to complete the finished process of refining the resources into whatever products they might be. But, but Japan, on the other hand, did industrialize parts of Korea, um, which, stream, which streamlined things a little bit for them. It, it was highly observable um, that they would also um, create these systems that would be more transparent. So one of those systems would be the tax system. Um, and I guess you could argue that might be a good thing. Maybe it's less um, apt to be corrupt, a modern tax system rather than the old, um, I don't even know what they called it in Korea. I can give you the Persian name, but it was called like a Zamandari tax system, essentially, where the tax system is up to the individual tax collector. If he t he's supposed to collect this much and bring it back to whoever he's supposed to bring it back to, but anything he collects above that is his to keep. So, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's random, right? Well, so the modern, more like standardized tax system, maybe that's an improvement. I, I, I don't know. Um, but there's still these major hues of a mercantilist relationship in which Korea only exists for labor and resources to benefit Japan, right? Like that's essentially what that mercantilist, mercantilist relationship is. Um, and many modern capitalist apologists in Korea or in Japan cite the productivity numbers from that time period or the modern amenity numbers that are provided, right? Like this much plumbing was put in or these many people were put to work or the, the GDP changed in this way or the GNP changed in this way. Why do so many people use these types of numbers to measure the success of a colonial enterprise, or really any enterprise, we don't spend a lot of time looking at like what happened in terms of autonomy or freedom of information or education systems or, or, or anything else, or even if people were happy, we don't look at those types of things. Why rely on the numbers? I mean, positivism is, is one answer, but why? That, that's exactly what I was going to say, right? Oh, okay. The <laughs> lens has dominated, I mean, every aspect of our lives, right? So it's, we use statistics and in this case, put things in economic terms to measure their success or failure, right? Regardless of what it is, even if it's the subjugation of human beings, right? Unfortunately. So rather than go through those figures, I found some figures that came to us, come to us from the Library of Congress all the way back on a in a 1990 survey, uh, which is interesting. The U.S. Library of Congress went, when it went, went deep into numbers on this, but they did. Um, I forget who was on the research committee, and it really doesn't matter for this episode, but but here's the quote that's kind of interesting from this, this publication in the Library of Congress. Again, from 1990, looking back at this era, virtually all industries were owned either by Japan-based corporations or by Japan Japanese, but, excuse me, virtually all industries were owned either by Japan-based corporations or by Japanese corporations in Korea. As of 1942, indigenous capital constituted only 1.5% of the total capital invested in Korean industries. Korean entrepreneurs were cha charged interest rates 25% higher than their Japanese counterparts. So it was difficult for large Korean enterprises to emerge. More and more farm farmland was taken over by the Japanese and an increasing proportion of Korean farmers either became sharecroppers or migrated to Jap Japan or Manchuria as laborers. As greater quantities of Korean rice were exported to Japan, per capita consumption of rice among the Koreans declined. Between 1932 and 36, per capita consumption of rice declined to half the level consumed between 1912 and 1916. Although the government uh, imported coarse grains from Manchuria to augment the Korean food supply, per capita consumption of food grains in 1944 was 35% below that of 1912 to 1916. And again, I get these numbers don't necessarily correlate, correlate to other numbers that I had mentioned before, but what we're seeing here is numbers can be manipulated to tell whatever type of story you want to tell. And in this case, the Library of Congress is challenging the narrative that Japan's capitalist successes in Korea benefited Koreans. In this case, they're using their numbers to say that it didn't. Regardless of how the economy grew, it didn't benefit Koreans. And I think those are pretty clear. An economic side note at this point in time also is interesting. Japan forced Korean farmers um, to basically become drug dealers in many cases or drug producers. Um, opium, the opium market was huge in the 1930s between all three countries, China, Korea, and Japan. 
And um, many Korean farmers were forced to um, supply that opium market. And then Koreans themselves were forcefully employed as mules or distributors to basically distribute opium. All three countries, to be blunt, were addicted to opium consumption at this point in time, both like under the under the counter um, consumption of opium and then, of course, over the counter, which opium was obviously used by, by Japanese doctors and so on and Korean doctors and Chinese doctors, but, but under the counter as well, right? Like, so it's kind of interesting that there was an opium opium epidemic that also informed part of the economic rationale of J Japanese control over rural areas. It was so that they could produce opium. Um, all of this leads to a slow buildup to the 1943 Central Agricultural Association, which of course was a Japanese association, which meant to control all rural productivity in Korea and inclusion was compulsory and all surplus produced in Korea was extracted to feed the war machine. So if you're doing the math at home, you already know 1943, we're in the middle of, of, of the world war. So that was the rationale for Japan. Like you are property of Japan. All of your uh, rural pr rural productivity will be used to feed the war machine. It, it has to be. So um, there is no autonomy for Japanese or Japanese, excuse me, Korean farmers um, during the war. Beginning in 1932, we get the formal Japanese invasion of Manchuria, which again deserves its own standalone episode. I'm going to go through some history here relatively quickly, but regardless, which led to many Korean exiles fleeing deeper into China or even, and this is important, joining as they fled further north, the Red Army. The, the, at this point, uh, we've skipped some history here, but long story short, Bolshevik revolution happened in 1917, and we're no, no longer talking about czarist Russia. We're talking now about the Soviet Union. And many Koreans, uh, to try and flee the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, and even some Chinese end up joining the Red Army. Um, there's also some interesting resistance movements that had been hanging out in Manchuria and gaining traction. Um, some Korean indigenous movements in Manchuria, um... I think I said that correctly, but regardless, one of those is going to be led by a very famous individual who plays a huge role in Korean history. Kim Il-sung um, would be one of the most notable guerrilla fighters that's hanging out in this region. Um, his legacy is something that I guess we'll talk a little bit about later. Not a lot because that requires its own episode, but the whole Kim family does. But regardless, he gets a start as a guerrilla fighter in Manchuria. I guess that's what I'm trying to spit out. His forces eventually grow to include parts of what we would call the National Revolutionary Army, the People's Liberation Army, and together, once, of course, they coalesce, they become what we call the KVA, or the Korean Volunteer Army. During World War II, these forces, and again, they, they played a major role in, in fighting Japan during World War II, evolved further as the tides turned and more and more Koreans in the Japanese army, because again, we'll get to that, the, the Japanese had also conscripted Koreans to fight for them. Um, so you've got Koreans fighting on both sides, both on the Japanese side and the allied side, fighting each other, which again is going to be a theme in Korea as we move forward. Um, it's super interesting. Anyway, many defect from the Japanese army and join the KVA and it evolves into what we call the Korean people's army, which is, is still the army um, that we talk about today. It's the army, of course, of, of North Korea, but we'll get to that in just a second. So again, Kim Il-sung cutting his teeth as a guerrilla fighter during this time period, um, working heavily with Soviets, and you can do the math at home of what this, this is going to lead to. Okay, World War II is where things begin to change, obviously. It's, 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 a, it's a globally change, globally changing. Is that even proper? Uh, I've been talking too long. Anyway, it's an important event, in case anyone didn't know, um, and things change. Okay, as full-scale war breaks out uh, post-1937, and I get that's a little bit earlier number than, than Westerners think of. They usually start it with the uh, uh, Hitler's invasion, um, East, Poland, etc., but for us, it's going to start in 1937. Essentially, a full-scale war break, breaks out, and labor shortages in Japan um, begin to influence the choices they're going to make in Korea. The reason they are having labor shortages in Japan is because of compulsory military service for all young men in Japan. They're basically taken from their jobs and put into the Japanese Imperial Army. Um, or Imperial Navy or whatever. Um, and this leads to a different type of conscription. So the Japanese young men are going to be conscripted into the military, whether they liked it or not. Korean workers are going to replace them. So they're going to conscript Korean workers, not into the army at first, that they do later, and move them to Japan to basically keep the industry moving in, in, in the metropole back home. 
As many as 670,000 Koreans were forced to work in Japan, as well as other imperial holdings. Keep in mind, Japan at this point is an empire. It has holdings throughout the Pacific. Um, they worked in factories. They worked in mines. All of this took place under something that was called the National Mobilization Law. Um, tied to earlier movements of people, uh, sometimes forced place, sometimes optional of Koreans, this meant that it as many as 2 million Koreans had been removed from Korea. Again, 670,000 immediately for the war, but then also well over a million um, prior to that. Related, as Japan became des desperate, by 1944, they began to conscript Koreans into the Imperial Army, as I just mentioned. 110,000 Koreans um, had the... I don't know. Is it an advantage? I was going to say of being conscripted into the Imperial Army, but I would argue no, because we know the Imperial, spoiler alert, they're going to lose um, World War II. Um, but is that better than, I guess, being conscripted to work in mines? I don't I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But anyway, so I, I don't know why I was using that terminology, but you get the idea. 110,000 Koreans conscripted into the military service in 1944. One of the most controversial topics during this time period, and even the prior time period that, again, like many, deserves its own standalone episode as research is really blowing up around this issue, is the role of the Ainafu. Uh, I, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, but long story short, these are the comfort women. Um, and comfort women are not specifically um, just from Korea. They're from the Philippines and, and other Japanese holdings, um, Taiwan, um, I don't remember where else. There's a, a whole host of other Japanese holdings. At least 200,000 comfort women are forced into service and uh, quote unquote by the Japanese Imperial Army. Um, though the exact number specifically of Koreans remains up in the air. And this is, again, I, I, I must stress the research on this is still, still new. They're still digging in. I mean, recently, Japan and Korea have, have tried to reconcile their relationship. And one of the big hangups and one of the things that, that keeps them from, from really seeing eye to eye on a lot of issues is, is Korea still waiting for, for, I'm not even sure what the word is, reconciliation regarding this question of comfort women. Um, one of the ways they got many of the Korean women to serve um, was fake recruitment. They... In other cases, like in the Philippines, they just outright took women. But in Korea, I guess, yeah, again, having a little bit more respect for Koreans than other, other peoples around the world, they recruited these women under the faked auspices that they would basically become like nurses or whatever whatever, whatever uh, role you might imagine they would play in the Japanese Imperial Army. That is not the role they were given. They were not given that role. Their role was to be um, abused. Uh, abused psychologically, abused emotionally, abused physically. One of the justifications the Japanese Imperial Army used to argue that, they, that the comfort women are going to serve an important role in the Japanese um, Imperial Army was that it would reduce rape. Um, I think all of our listeners are probably well aware of the atrocity known as the Rape of Nanjing, which it took place, of course, in China, not Korea, um, in which um, hundreds of thousands of people were raped. And I say people, I don't necessarily want to gender it. It didn't matter. P people were raped by the Japanese Imperial Army in Nanjing. And one of the problems that the Japanese saw in that wasn't necessarily a moral or ethical one. And, I'm, and I, I should say Japanese leadership. I'm willing to bet there are individual Japanese that had a problem with this. I don't want to paint with the broad brush that every Japanese person was 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 doing this. But enough were and the leadership was certainly fine with it, that it was a massive problem. And one of the problems they identified was actually, again, not moral or ethical. It was the spread of STDs um, and, of course, the spread of un unwanted pregnancies. They thought that if it could, they could control the sexual impulses of their soldiers to exert power over what they saw as, quote unquote, lesser peoples, that it would lead to less problems that they would eventually have to deal with once they controlled these regions, whether we're talking about China or, again, the Philippines or Taiwan or Okinawa even or, uh, you know, all of these other places. So um, that that was part of one of the reasons they started to recruit, basically impress, um, comfort women. This was outright slavery. There's no other word for this. This was sexual slavery. This That's what this was. This was slavery. In the, in the middle of the 20th century, 
we could argue what 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 versions of slavery have existed because of economic reasons or or, or wage labor or things like that. There, there's no argument here. This is this is slavery by every definition. This was outright enslavement of these women. Again, many Koreans, since that's our topic, but also women from a whole host of other countries. Um, even the Dutch, um, there were Dutch holdings, obviously, in Southeast Asia. In Indonesia, for example, Dutch women were impressed in the Japanese Imperial Army um, um, as comfort women, which is, I mean, I don't know that a lot of people actually know. Did you know that? Nope. Um, so this is slavery for sexual purposes. Um, they use the terminology brothel. They would put these women in brothels because I think it insinuates agency. In other words, if they use the word brothel, it goes back to the idea that these women are sex workers of their own volition. Um, mm. but that is not, I mean, is that what, is that why you think they use that term? That's what oh, I'm yeah, reading. Into this. Sure. Mm -hmm. But this was not a choice for these women. These were not sex workers that were doing this of their own volition. They, they, they were slaves. Um, many of them were forced to see from, from some accounts of the time period between 25 and 40 men a day, a day. Uh, one of the things that they did with these women is they forced sterilization through one of two ways, one intentional, one unintentional. The first one in it that was intentional was the use of salvarsan, which basically you're, you're sterilizing these women, which has a whole host again of moral and ethical ramifications. Um, for these women, uh, aside from the fact that they're enslaved. But also, when you are seeing 25 to 40 members of the Imperial Army a day, there is so much damage that is brought to these women's reproductive organs that they also become sterilized from, from that. Um, the other issue that is often overlooked, and we could, we could have a whole episode on this, there's so much research coming out on, on this topic specifically, but we just don't have time to get into it right now. But one of the things that's also overlooked when we think about this is not just how this is leading to still problematic relations between Korea and Japan to this day, but the women themselves, once the war is over and Korea eventually does gain, well, independence in air quotes, we'll get to that in a second. But once Japan is no longer the colonizer of Korea, the survivors, and not just survivors in, in, in Korea, but survivors that end up going back to Japan or survivors that end up in the Philippines or survivors that end up in Taiwan, are seen as social pariahs. Once people are aware of their past and being impressed into, into the Japanese imperial um, comfort women, they, they're social pariahs. So their lives are forever changed. They don't get a chance to recover because even their own societies cast them out. Um, anyway, I mean, is there, do you have any, any thoughts on comfort women uh, regarding, um, well, I mean, regarding comfort women, I guess, is what I'm trying to spit out. No, it's a I feel like I'm just talking a lot about this and maybe I'm missing some, some themes here. It's atrocious, obviously. Yeah. Dehumanizing. Another example of dehumanization, right? As the war raged on, um, many um, people are forced, Koreans specifically, are forced to serve on the outskirts of the empire, building makeshift airfields and barriers and trying to make it more, more difficult for the allied forces, predominantly the U.S. or resistance forces in China, and I mean, even as far south as Vietnam, to attack the Japanese. So the Koreans are then kind of literally on the front line, which makes them susceptible, not necessarily just to the Japanese, but the Koreans conscripted into the Japanese Imperial Army are now sus a sus a suspect, subject to allied attacks. Hundreds of thousands of Koreans became casualties of either the horrid labor conditions or attacks by allied forces, predominantly American forces, because they are forced to work within the Japanese um, military industrial complex against their will. Literal thousands of Korean workers were in Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the bombings. Thousands. Some of the survivors that were forced to work uh, for the Japanese imperial process um, were never even allowed back to Korea um, or post-war Japan. A good example of these, of a, of a stateless people, um, although unlike other people we talk about, these are people that would, would like a state and don't have one, are the, called the uh, Sakhalin Koreans. Basically, it was in a Soviet-conquered region. They were never even allowed back to Korea post-end um, post uh, post of the war. We also have to talk, and this is where things are going to get messy, about war crimes, um, specifically Japanese war crimes. While some are well-known, as I already mentioned, like the rape of Nanjing, Others are less so, and one of the less so known war crimes that included Koreans was the Unit 731, better known as the Kamo det Detachment. This unit was located specifically uh, in Manchukuo, which is basically northeast China, 
Um, this gave it access to countless Chinese, Korean, and Russian subjects. And you're going to get what I mean when I say the word subjects here in just a second. The softer name for Japanese propaganda, why they had this special unit, 731, is they called it the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Guangdong Army. Um, and that name was given, in, given to it by, by Hirohito, the emperor. This unit was led by a general named Shiro Ishii. And what they would do, essentially, is not necessarily just purify water or, or prevent epidemics. They tested biological and chemical weapons on subjects, specifically Chinese, Korean, and Russian subjects. At this facility um, in northeast China, up to 500,000 people died. The most sources that I've seen argue that not a single person that had been in prison there survived. Um, they committed mass acts of torture. These tortures included injecting people with various diseases to see how they would react. They har harvested organs and experimented on what people could live with and without. They did forced dehydration of people to see how long people could survive. Amputations. Um, the word rape comes up again, which led to, uh, actually there, there was no protection used, so to speak. And this led to a lot of babies who were also experimented on at this facility. They experimented with implementing frostbite on people and what people could withstand. And they also did pandemic research. In other words, they would um, experiment with various germs and, and, and germ theory and, and see if they could get, get, get pandemics to go through um, the prison population here in Unit 731. This also did lead to weapons production and deployment of chemical warfare on China. So yes, Japan engaged in chemical warfare in World War II on China. As far as a Cold War side note regarding Unit 731, because as we know, the Cold War is going to immediately follow this, the Soviet Union, upon discovering what took place at Unit by Unit 731, prosecuted the Japanese leaders of Unit 731. In contrast... The United States gave the people that worked at Unit 731 immunity for intel or to explain their experiments um, and to see what they might what might be useful. This, of course, is reminiscent to the more famous Operation Paperclip in which the United States um, allowed also Nazi scientists and doctors and so on and so forth um, to come here and, and share their 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 findings. Um I don't want to paint the, the Soviet Union as, 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 a, as a hero here for prosecuting these individuals um, because actually when they got prosecuted, they got some pretty lenient um, lenient terms. I think some as low as like two years of being in prison, um, which is, I mean, for, I mean, for the war crimes I just described, like that's, that's almost nothing. Um, anyway, I mean, is this something you, you had heard of? I think you know, you knew of Operation Paperclip, but did you know the U.S. was also doing this with Japanese scientists and doctors from Unit 731? No, yeah, I definitely heard a paper clip, but not this for sure. So as early as 1943, the Allies had already been considering the fate of Korea. They held a conference in Cairo in which FDR, Winston Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek start to mull over the idea of what's called trusteeship control of Korea. So they could basically control the fate, which is obviously not autonomy or self-determination, but we'll talk about that later. Joseph Stalin, being an ally, obviously should be part of the conversation as well. He would be included later in Tehran and then the more famous Yalta conference. But Cold War tensions had already been brewing, of course, at Yalta. Most people know that. The Soviets had officially declared war on Japan after the first bomb on Hiroshima. On August 10th of 1945, U.S. officials Dean Rusk and Charles Bonesteel began to pressure an occupation zone, <clears throat> excuse me, marked based, well, essentially it was based on Soviet mobilization. They chose the 38th parallel because that's where the Soviets had already mobilized in the north. They decided that this would also ensure that the allied occupation would include the important city of Seoul. The Soviets had already made inroads in the north through their mobilization in occupying Pyongyang. Japanese Governor General Abe had also seen the writing on the wall, and he reached out to certain Koreans to prep them for independence. So we've got basically three different forces, so to speak, seeing a different Korea moving forward. We've got the allied forces, but they're split between a Soviet vision for what Korea will look like 
in an allied vision or a more uh, capitalist vision, for lack of a better term. And then, of course, we have the Japanese vision. And, and, and though we're not going to apologize for the horrors that the Japanese have unleashed on Korea, basically what we've talked about for the last hour or so, we do think Japan probably had a little bit better vision of, or not, not even vision. They just probably had a better understanding of what Korea already looked like than the Allied powers. That doesn't mean we think Japan should have any say so in the fate of what Jap uh, Korea would look like moving forward. But you do have these three powers that perhaps if they had all consulted each other and agreed, we might have a very different situation moving forward. Now, what about Korean self-determination? That's really the elephant in the room. Maybe none of these should power. In fact, it's not even maybe. None of these powers should have any say-so in what Korea looked like. Korea should have a say-so in what it looked like. What was created was something called the Committee for Preparation of Korean Independence, and it was formed in 1945 under a very left-leaning leader named Leo Woon Young, and hopefully I pronounced that correctly. There were also some more conservative Koreans that formed their own Congress in Seoul and proposed Syngman Rhee as their president. Regardless, we're not necessarily going to get into left-right politics for Korea at this moment in time, but at least both were about self-determination. We must say that. Further, in Pyongyang, people's committees had already begun land redistribu redistribution measures, and most of those proved in favor of Soviet aid. So we already see the North moving a little bit more towards the Soviet sphere of influence. Political maneuvering um, within the committees also led to some of the provisional government being formed under what we, uh, well, under someone we've already discussed, Kim Il-sung, with some support from the Soviet Colonel General uh, Shtaikov. As lands were redistributed, especially in the North, and industries become nationalized under Kim, 400,000 Koreans fled south of the 38th parallel. Now, many of these Koreans weren't necessarily fleeing south because of, 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 of violent reprials of the Kim regime, although that we could probably discuss later Kims, but they were fleeing because essentially their quote unquote private properties were being nationalized. But we have to keep in mind that many of these 400,000 Koreans had been the Koreans that had sold out their own people to the Japanese occupiers before the war. Um, so while it's okay probably to have a little bit of empathy for them as they flee across the border, we must understand for a lot of Koreans in the North, they are seen alongside the oppressive Japanese. All sources cite um, that there was almost no violence during the land reform program in the North, at least during the post-war era. Now, formal Soviet occupation in the North ends um, in 1948. In contrast, what ends up happening in the South, of course, when I say the South, I mean South of the 38th parallel, as decided by, uh, by the U.S. officials we already discussed, is that Douglas had, M MacArthur had already issued Proclamation 1, um, which means that essentially the South is going to be formally occupied by the United States military. Um, English will become the official language of South Korea. Of course, we know that doesn't stick, but like that's what he wanted initially. And he would have a man named John Hodge administer the territory. Between 1945 and 1948, Hodge reported directly to Douglas MacArthur, who, of course, is overwatching um, essentially what's going on in Tokyo during that occupation. The interesting part is that neither really answered to Washington, D.C. U.S. leadership back home, quote unquote, had very little oversight in the remaking of Korea or even really Japan for that, that matter. Now, Hodge himself refused to recognize uh, Syngman Rhee or the Korean government in China, which had been operating since occupation by Japan. He even sent away a delegation. Again, keep in mind, we talked about this. There had already been a Korean government uh, put together in China during the occupation. He even outlawed the people's committees that were modeled on what happened in the North. So we, I mean, that's obvious. This is during the Red, the Red Scare. And uh, uh, MacArthur is obviously a very controlling individual. Um, and under Hodge, things in Korea became, uh, I don't, I don't want to say it's like full-blown martial law, more or less, but they're doing their best to basically stamp out any, any signs of Soviet influence. They also sent 500,000 Japanese individuals back to Japan, 500,000 that had been living in Korea. All of these measures, and I must keep, you know what, in fact, I want to take a pause for just a second and ask Nick about this. Do you have any thoughts on Douglas MacArthur issuing Proclamation 1? So I, I, I guess we framed it at this point. Korea has been under Jap Jap Japanese occupation for decades at this point. And then the Americans come along more or less thinking that they're going to at least liberate the South. But instead, we have U.S. military control, implementation of English as a language, kind of forcing their way into, 
a U.S. style of governance, a U.S. type of economy. I mean, any thoughts? We see a little yeah, bit this of is, this. Go ahead. This is par for the course, right? Like liberation is never true liberation, right? It always comes with strings attached. And like you said earlier, you know, where is the Korea's right to self-determination, right? It's non-existent. They're not sitting at any of these tables. They have no say in what's happening to their country, right? The U.S. military, at least in the South, where it comes in and quote unquote liberates them. But, it, you know, I love the term trusteeship as a euphemism for essentially colonialism, right? It's ridiculous. Right. And, and, and I must stress, like, like a lot of the control is in the South at this point. I mean, usually people look at the Soviets as the more controlling of the uh, post-World War II allied powers, and, I'm, and let's not talk about what they did in, in Eastern Europe, and then of course they are. But, but in the case of North Korea, at least initially, they weren't really as controlling as the United States was in the South. And this is nothing's more emblematic of that than the Daegu Uprising of 1946, or better known in Korea as the Octo uh, October Uprising. This is an uprising against the U.S. occupation, and it's led by thousands of peasants and urbanites alike. There is solidarity with the Korean Communist Party call for a strike. This strike included 250,000 individuals. And again, they're on general strike. Now, we already know the U.S. at this point is a very anti-union, very anti-labor organization. So they see this as, as part of like the whole Red Scare situation. Situation. Um, there is a martyr. Obviously, there's 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 always a martyr when we talk about rebellions or revolutions. It's almost a necessary element. The martyr in this case was a person named Kim Yong Tae. They're killed at the strike, and this led to larger and larger demonstrations that carry on in the coming days. Uh, specifically, the city of Busan becomes a hot spot, but other cities joined in demanding rations, labor rights, and importantly, this is the most important thing that they're demanding from the United States, the right to organize and self-determine, um, which is, again, it's, it's, it's crucial to understand. We've, we've spent the last hour plus talking about decades of occupation by Japan. U.S. comes in as a liberator and another occupation begins, or at least it's briefer, but it does begin. U.S. martial law is used to put down the demonstration, and this led to police rep repression, arrests, even tank deployments, and the use of far-right Korean allies to break up marches however they saw fit. So once the U.S. realizes that they don't necessarily want to use actual U.S. soldiers to break up these strikes, because that's a really bad look on the international scene, they do create, or they do already have allies that are on the far Korean right. They use them to break up the marches. This, of course, is colonialism 101. It's best if you use people that are willing to kind of sell out to the colonists to oppress their own people. It just, it's a, it's optically, it looks a little bit different. There end up being hundreds of deaths during this martial law period and two, uh, two and a half thousand um, arrests. Now, between 1946 and 1947, the Soviets and the U.S. had met, met in something called the Joint Commission. That was going to be the idea that they will jointly try and figure things out um, while the dust settles in the post-war period. The Soviets like um, the more, I don't want to use the word moderate, but he's more moderate than, than, than Kim. They like the more moderate Moon Young uh, government as a good balance. That that's basically them negotiating, say, essentially saying to the Americans, like, "Look, we we know you're you're scared to death of of Kim. Fine. What about Win Young? He is very left, but he's not as left as Kim. The U.S. still says uh, Woon Young is too far left, and the Soviets say, "Well, hey, how about we just both leave and let the Koreans decide?" The U.S. says no. Why do you think the U.S. says no to this? The Soviets actually come in, and again, they have a very bloody history of, of, of imperial practices themselves, but in, in the case of Korea, they do essentially say, hey, we want to, let's just let them have it. Let's let them have it, and they can figure it out. Why do you think the United States says no? I mean, that's what they do, right? They, 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 they're terrified of giving a country that even could have the remote possibility of having some kind of socialist or communist government the freedom to decide, right? And in fact, they'll overthrow a democratically elected leader so that they can ensure that that won't happen, right? And, and I think the Soviets saw the writing on the wall, and I think the Americans did as well, that, that Korea was definitely, most of Korea, if it was unified, would have leaned left. I don't know that it would look like the, what, the, the, the North Korea of today by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. In fact, we could argue the North Korea of today is a byproduct 
<clears throat> of this problem, right? It is of this problem that we we're talking about right here. It's become so extreme because of what transpired in 46, 47, 48, obviously in the Korean War, 50 through 53. Um, if, well, yeah, I mean, we could argue, right, that it might have been just a little bit left, but because of the U.S. actions, it pushed it all into Kim's control, right, essentially. Yeah, which I don't even argue is left at this point. I think it's it's far right. Yeah. I don't even know what you call yeah. it. A hereditary <laughs> right. dictatorship. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, the United States also made it illegal to cross the 38th parallel as of May of 1946. The United Nations is newly formed at this point, and it's watching um, – and it ends up intervening and says that elections should only take place in the South. The reason that they say this is that the Soviets also, the, you, the Soviets are part of the United Nations. They, during the debates that were going on there, they accused um, the South of probably having doctored results in any sort of election. They would argue that, that, that no matter what's going to happen, that the far right in Korea or the U.S. occupiers are going to doctor the results to ensure that a, a more moderate, not even moderate, a far right uh, 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 result will take place. That's what they think is going to happen. After the Daegu uprising, the United States feels the heat and begins to get, uh, be convinced now by Syngman Rhee that his more conservative leadership would be the way to go. So Hodge is going to have to change his tune on Rhee a little bit, because even though Rhee comes up through the, the Korean system and he's supported by other Koreans and there's a little bit of self-determination in there, the fact that he is very anti-communist um, and, again, right-leaning enough that the U.S. will will approve his leadership, they're going to probably have to back him because he's their, he's their best chance at, at stopping some sort of red wave from taking place in Asia, at least in their own minds, right? Further, the, un, the other main popular opposition, I must stress, when Young, who we've been talking about a little bit here, the one that the Soviets put forth as the most moderate left solution here, had already been assassinated by a far-right nationalist. So now the U.S. Is, is like, well, who's next in line? Who are Koreans going to get behind? Or at least some Koreans get, get, get behind. There's other, another uprising that takes place on an island of the South of Korea. It's called the Jeju Uprising. It's a very important uprising. It takes place in April of 1948 as, as all of this political maneuvering is taking place. This uprising in 48 is to protest specifically Re, though, which of course is going to muddy the water. Water. This escalated the need for a permanent resolution. Re had technically won enough of the elections or the electoral processes, and the Jeju uprising at this point is again it's a very left leaning uprising. They they're up, they're they're contesting the results of elect uh, of the elections. The South and North um, send representatives to meet without the United States consent in April of 1948 to deal with what they they, they deem a crisis. Right, the uprising, um, the clear division that's taking place around the 38th parallel, and both agree to send these representatives. This is important. Like they didn't seek U.S. consent for this. They are going. This is about self determination. They decide they're going to send these reps without U.S. permission, and they're going to ask for the removal of all troops, U.S. troops, and the creation of a unified government. In the meantime, uh, Re is now the United States puppet, more or less. They've, 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 they've made that decision. Both Re and Hodge denounce this, uh, this meeting, and one of the representatives ends up even being assassinated. The tensions never subside. The United Nations pushes, pushes for elections in the South. They push them forward. And as 1948 drew to a close, Re won, though again, the results from all international watchers, not just the Soviets and not just the North, are going to be questions. The Republic of Korea is established in the South, more or less under the leadership of, 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 of Re. And this, of course, took place shortly after the Democratic People's Republic was established in the North. And the division began to seem like it was going to be more and more permanent. Uh, the South initially was more contested in Korea, though. And I must stress this, there were many more rebellions and, and attempts at revolution in the South, at least initially. Um, some might argue that later on, as time passed and, and, and the Kim dynasty continued on, it's because it, it you couldn't have a rebellion or a revolution up there because they became so much, so much more oppressive and there was so much indoctrination and I would probably not argue with that. But initially that actually wasn't happening and there weren't the same sort of rebellions um, against the occupiers in that case. Um, one of the easiest examples off the top of my head is the Yosu Sunshine Rebellion that took place in Korea after, after division. Ri also created uh, what was called the Bodo League to root out all leftists in the South. 
Um, this led to, of course, numerous, numerous uh, crimes, really, against his own people. One of the most famous of those would be the Mengyang Massacre of 1949, in which 88 Koreans, South Koreans, are killed by the re-regime. Re um, there's lots of literature on the repression that took place in the South throughout the 19, basically the 1950s, from, from, from the war, the Korean War in this case, forward. Lots of things that people don't necessarily understand about the South, because the South has, has come through pretty well in, in, in the modern era. We have to, I guess, give credit where it's due. But it took a lot of blood and repression throughout the 1950s and 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s um, to get to that point. Anyway, uh, what I do want to mention is that the Korean War is going to be, of course, the linchpin to all of this. It's going to break out in 1950, and it's going to last to 1953. That, of course, uh, we're well into this episode. That deserves its own. I'm not going to spend any time talking about the Korean War itself, but I do think I need to kind of finish with this idea that even though there's a war that takes place between the North and the South, I think most of our listeners are, are very well aware that even the war doesn't lead to a resolution, right? It leads to a ceasefire, an armistice that, that, that's still taking place to this day. There has not been any formal end to the Korean War, just more or less uh, probably one of the longest ceasefires in modern history. So with that, we have essentially the end, the official end of the Japanese occupation of Korea and obviously a little discussion of the U.S. occupation as well. I think that's all I have. I mean, that was a lot. That was a lot to go through and, and hopefully we touched upon everything. Are there any themes in this colonial example, this colonial case study of the many that we've already done um, that, that jumped out to you? I mean, just one final thought, I think, on what you ended with sort of is this idea that we see often, in this case, a little different, right? Because the country is essentially split in two and two different, you know, regimes are taking place. But how frequently a war comes onto the scene to stabilize a destabilized area? Right. So like you said, even in the South, there are these rebellions going on and these multiple massacres happening as, you know, Rhee is attempting to solidify his leadership. And then the Korean War breaks out and essentially stabilizes both areas in the fight against one another. Right. And it essentially puts an end to this entire narrative that we've been talking about for the past, you know, two hours or whatever at this point, how frequently that happens. Right. You know, after the French Revolution, we see all, all kinds of warfare and so forth. It's just interesting how often that seems to follow periods of instability. You know, a war breaks out and then leads to this stabilization. I'm not saying they like manufactured the war for that function, but it does happen frequently. Throughout. Yeah, but that stabilization is, we could argue on both sides, at least uh, initially, for the worse, right? It stabilizes oh, North, yeah, totally. North Korea to be become rather than this this beacon of, of leftist progress, it ends up being a, a totalitarian dictatorship, arguably one of the worst in the world now. And of, and of course, South Korea goes through this phase as well. Although, like I said, things have definitely gotten better more recently in the last, uh, what is it, three, four decades. Um, yeah, I mean, it only definitely functions to serve the, the leadership. Correct. Right? So that, that stability is not stability that benefits everybody, right? So No, exactly. Anyway, yeah. uh, you want to take us out? That was a long one. That was a long yeah. one. For sure. If you've made it this far, thank you. I hope you enjoyed, you know, this history that Jared's provided of the Japanese colonization of Korea. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters for their continued support. If you would like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash revolution and ideology. I am Nick. I'm Jared. Later. <laughs>